Hello there. Um, so we're going to introduce ourselves to begin with. So um, I'll go first. Uh, I'm Carl Baxter. I'm one of the senior lecturers and a programme lead at the National Centre for Food Manufacturing. Hello, I'm Vanessa Sutton. and I'm, I'm an associate lecturer and um, look after the food safety and quality of um, food. And thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Nicola Crewe and I'm also at the NCFM as a lecturer and I'm a microbiologist and have been working in the food industry for several years now. Okay, so we're going to um, share a presentation with you today um, about fantastic festive food. I thought that'd be appropriate for the time of year. Um, yes, we're from the National Centre for Food Manufacturing it's a national resource for the food and drink uh, industry. And what we do is we, um, we do training for people all the way from level three uh, uh, in further education up to master's degrees. Uh, we also do a lot of research to support industry, both in the UK and abroad. So if you are from the uh, food and drink uh, industry, then by all means get in contact with us if you're, you're interested. Um, we will give you an email at the end of our presentation that you can contact us on. All right, so our presentation, you know, um, according to the Independent and the BBC Good Food Guide, a popular Christmas Day menu is prawn cocktail, followed by roast turkey with all the trimmings, and then at the end, uh, Christmas pudding to, to round it off. So we're going to base our presentation on those three things, the starter, the main course, and the pudding. So to start with, we'll th think about uh, prawn cocktail, and I've put one on the screen there, but I've actually built one this morning as well, and you can see that there, very nice. I've um, chopped up some crunchy uh, cos lettuce into that with some cucumber and tomato, put some, uh, these, these aren't just normal prawns, these are organic Madagascan prawns, um, and then a lovely um, Mary Rose sauce on the top there. And I've just topped it off with some chives. So, but really the star of that show is the prawn. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the main for my part of this presentation. So the, the global market for prawns or shrimps, as they're known in the rest of the world, is, is 6.7 million tons by 2024. That's, that's what's expected to be. That's an awful lot of prawns that we're eating. Uh, and the main producers, as it says here, are from India, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, and Ecuador. So mainly from the Far East. And shrimp are popular because they tend to grow in the seas there. They're available in those countries. They've got lots of coastline to, to fish from. But they're also very nutritious. They're high in protein, healthy because they're low in fat. And they're quite a good source of omega-3 fatty acids as well. So they're a really good resource to have for food in those areas. Now, prawns can be caught as they have been for a long, long time. And that market is fairly static at about 3 million tons per year of raw material. Uh, and we're seeing more growth in aquaculture or farmed um, prawns or shrimps. And um, since... 2011, that's grown from about 7 million tons per year to, to 9 million tons per year in 2017. So we're expecting that probably the court uh, catch will be fairly flat at 3 million tons, but that growth area is going to be from the aquaculture or the farmed um, prawns or shrimps. Now, <clears throat> environmentally, we really have to consider the environment uh, because it's very important. Um, there are some risks associated with this because if uh, if you're going out with trawling boats and you're trawling for shrimp, if you're using bottom trawling equipment, that can scrape along the bed of the sea and damage the ocean floor. So, so it's best not to do that. Uh, farms are great, but poorly managed farms can also cause damage because they can cause pollution, not just to the rivers or to the sea, but to the soil around them as well. And indeed, some sometimes if they're poorly managed, there might be illegal labour practices in some countries and uh, fisheries. 
So what you can do is look out for um, these um, these logos on the, the, the prawns or shrimps that you buy from the Aquaculture Stewardship Council or the Marine Stewardship Council as well. They're both more reliable sources. So I did a little experiment uh, yesterday uh, because uh, when you look at a shrimp or a, or a prawn, we actually only eat about half of the weight of of what's in what's what's caught or, or farmed. And um, I took a one of my organic Madagascan prawns and I weighed it. It was twenty two grams in total. And then I took the shell off it very carefully, making sure I did the best job I could. And you can see here that the in the middle, I managed to get a ten gram prawn out of the actual um, product that I had. And just to make sure that I was getting it all right, I weighed the shell on the end there uh, to the right hand side, and I had 12 grams. So you can see the calculation at the bottom here, 100% is uh, 22 grams. So to work out the percentage of the actual prawn bit that we eat, I took the 10 grams that it weighed, divided it by the 22 grams, multiplied by 100, and that gave me 45%. And then just to double check my maths, I did the same with the waste, and that came to 55%. So 55 and 45 adds up to the 100. So that's great. I knew I got my sums right. Okay, but the point is, if we are looking at sort of um, 12 uh, million tons of prawns like this on the left every year being caught, then that's going to generate an awful lot of waste. And sometimes the waste can be a pollutant. So here that there's a, a, a picture from a, an Indian newspaper that shows uh, the waste that people have actually dumped illegally. And as I say, it's about 6.6 .6 million tons of waste per year. So we need to be careful that we're not causing pollution. Now, what is shrimp waste made of? Well, most of it is actually water. So if we're going to use that waste, we have to take the water out first in the main. And we can do that by drying it. And it's about 50 to 70 percent water. And once it's dried, the rest of it is mostly made out of calcium at 51 percent, protein at 30 percent. And then this thing, this thing called chitin at 17 percent. And historically, um, the waste has commonly been used as an animal feed additive or uh, for fertilizer uh, to put into the soil, just to put some nutrients back into the soil. But they're not very valuable. And so the reason why people dump it illegally is because it's not worth their time to actually invest in doing something meaningful with the waste. So what we want to try and do as scientists is work out how can we add value to that waste and make it more useful to us. So the chitin is one of the things that's in there at 17%. And you can see the structure of the chitin on the right-hand side of this slide at the bottom. It's a large structural polysaccharide. And you can see the glucose molecules there in the sort of pink, the salmon pink color. Um, and uh, the, the structure gives it strength. So like cellulose in plants, chitin can provide strength to the bodies of the seafood invertebrates like shrimp, but also you can find it in fungi like mushrooms and also in insects. So, you know, you've got hard insects crawling around. Uh, that's chitin on the outside that makes their shell. But actually, whilst chitin is very strong, it's also biodegradable. So that gives us some ideas about how we might be able to use it. And that's what scientists have been working on. They've been trying to find valuable uses for chitin. So examples might be surgical gauzes or threads. So if you imagine you're a doctor or a surgeon and you're trying to repair someone's wound, you might use a gauze to maybe reconstruct someone's skin. And then the, the skin can grow over the top of that gauze. And because it's biodegradable, it just dissolves or fades away. And uh, the skin is left there and it helps with the healing. And the same is true with the threads. They can use that either to stitch with or, or, or to actually build up um, um, sort of surgical reconstruction. Now, in the food industry, um, there are functional food additive uses that we can have. So we can use it as an emulsifier. 
And an emulsifier is when we use it to mix oil and water so it becomes stable. So a mayonnaise is a good example of that, where you mix oil and water, or maybe a salad dressing. Uh, it can be used as a flavor enhancer. Um, one use, which I quite like, is you can use it to maintain the head on a pint of beer. So if you have it in beer, and you get that sort of frothy head on the top of the beer, by having some kaizan in it, it can actually help to keep that uh, head there and it, it won't disappear as, as quickly. You can use it as a clarifying agent, also known as a deflocculant. What that means is that if you've got bits sort of in a dirty bowl or in a dirty piece of water, by adding this, uh, this uh, chitin, it can bond with those molecules and the particles in the, in the water and it sort of bundles them together. And because of that, they become heavier and they sink to the bottom. So you can use it as a clarifying agent. And then another really interesting one is you can use it to coat fruits. Um, so I've got this example here on the screen where we've got um, tomatoes. Uh, the one on the left has been coated and the one on the right hasn't. So the, the, the picture here is the one before and then after 14 days and, the, uh, and then after more days. And you can see that the one on the right that hasn't been coated is deteriorating, whereas the one that's been coated is protected and therefore doesn't deteriorate as fast. So it can extend the shelf life of fruit. And then the other thing, you'll all have heard that we're trying to replace plastic packaging to be more biodegradable and so on. And people have been trying to maybe use chitin to do that with as well. So lots of uses that people have put forward. But after quite a lot of years, I have to say that people have found it quite difficult to work with. It's sensitive to processing, and the process needs to be refined a bit more so that it becomes more worthwhile and, and useful and sustainable. But work's ongoing. Um, but I was talking with someone from the industry uh, last week about this subject, and they told me that one of the ways that people are focusing now is rather than looking at uh, shrimp or prawn waste uh, to extract chitin, is that they're just focusing on extracting the best way to extract the flavor from them so that they can make oils and oleo resins as flavor ingredients for food, a bit like the picture on the right hand side there. Okay, so I hope that was interesting. A little bit of background as to what happens with prawns and the waste. And, you know, as uh, if you're interested in getting into the food industry or if you're interested in food science, then that's the sort of thing maybe you could work on in the future. Okay, thank you. And now I'll hand over to my colleague, Vanessa. Hello, and uh, welcome to the humble roast potato. So I'm going to share with you um, how your potato gets to your plate um, from right from the beginning in the fields. Okay. So we're starting off with um, a life cycle of the potato plant and the life cycle can take between 12 and 20 weeks to grow. So uh, normally they would be planted in the springtime. So we're talking around March time. Um, and, and if because it takes between uh, 12 to 20 weeks, it can be harvested um, in um, early July or you can wait until August, September time, depending on what you're looking for from your potato, whether it's a new potato or a larger jacket potato. So in the first place, we need to prepare the fields and the soil. And so the soil is prepared, it's cleaned, it's removed of uh, weeds, and they're looking for nutri nutritions in the soil. So you're looking for a pH of around uh, between 5 and 6.5, they're the correct uh, growing conditions. And we're also looking for um, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium within the soil. So you're having to get it prepared before you want to put your seed potato in. So you get your seed potato. A seed potato is um, produced from um, an original plant, but it's also checked to make sure it's got no diseases um, before you plant that. So they're prepared by um, putting them out and you're getting these little eyes, what's called eyes growing on the potato. And once you've got one eye, that is sufficient. But if you've got two or three, that's uh, preferable as well for your yield. You then plough your field and you plant the seed potatoes 
and um, the seed the, or the eye is pointing upwards in the ground and that will start to um, grow on there. Well, the spacing between them is roughly um, a ruler, so 30 centimetres between them. If they are too close together, you will get smaller potatoes growing because you've not given them enough room. And if the uh, seed potatoes are planted a little bit further apart, then you will get larger potatoes. So again, it depends on what you're looking for in your crop. As you can see, there's pictures of uh, um, the potatoes, the chit potatoes, and then the fields full of um, potatoes growing and they're flowering on there. So then they get um, harvested. Um, and again, it's uh, depending on what time of year you want them. So if you want new potatoes, you'll be looking at the top uh, growth on the plant. But if you want um, a larger potato, you will uh, wait longer in the summer. And you've probably seen tractors in fields um, harvesting those potatoes around late August and September on there. Thank you. So once they've been harvested, they go into storage and the storage is, um, depending on how many fields of potatoes you've got, they will um, either put them in what's known as boxes um, or they'll be leaving them in um, stands on there. And again, this is really key on how you keep your potatoes. The humidity of your potatoes is imperative because if you have too much moisture in there, that can then start um, condensation and then that will trigger mold growth. Also the temperature, if it's too warm, again, you could trigger off um, diseases you can um, on there. And again, we're preventing that. So it's about keeping the temperature between six and 10 degrees within these warehouses uh, where they're stored. Once uh, the storage is maintained and you've got it, you've got to be checking that there's uh, no rodents, no pests, no diseases. So again, it's all about the quality and the maintenance of the environment within that. From there, they will then go into packing um, warehouses where they're graded and um, packed on um, on the line. This um, will happen is that they'll go into over rollers where stones are removed, where the sizes are removed so the smaller uh, potatoes will fall through if you want the larger potatoes. So again it's all about um, sorting them, getting them prepared and they will then be washed and bagged into different sizes. You've probably seen some in farm shops, you've probably seen some in uh, your supermarkets and you can buy them at different sizes. You can also buy washed potatoes, you can also buy unwashed potatoes on there. Thank you. So to get to your uh, roast potato, uh, the first thing to do is uh, you peel your potatoes and again this does depend on the variety of potato you've got and uh, because this will influence whether the colour of the skin, you can get white potatoes, you can get red potatoes. And that does come down to the variety. The, there are many different varieties of potatoes and the varieties will indicate the content of that potato. So they might be very starchy, you might get very waxy potatoes. So again, it depends on what you would like for your potato. We're looking at the roast potato. So the varieties we would be looking at are Maris Piper is your main potato for roasting, followed by your King Edwards. You also can use Desiree. Um, as well but the main one is your Maris Piper. So once you've peeled it you um, cut them into um, pieces on there and depending on the size of your roast potato but a good size um, chunk would be um, sort of a quarter of your potato on there and then you boil those you parboil them so you bring them up to um, boiling and then boil them for a good five minutes on there. You don't want them to, that they're breaking down. You want your potato to be slightly um, softer on the outside and just beginning to um, break down. Once you've done that, you drain them and make sure you've removed as much moisture as you can. Whilst that is happening, you prepare your pan that you're going to put your roast potatoes in. You have your um, oil in there, the fat of choice. Some people around Christmas will choose goose fat. Uh, vegetable oil is perfectly um, acceptable and is used in the main as well. It's entirely up to you what you would use. 
make sure that the oil is hot and then you would put in your potatoes from there, making sure that your potatoes are slightly rough around the edges um, on there. If you feel that your potato is still a little bit hard, just sort of um, bash them against the sides in your saucepan or rough them up with a fork. It's just to make sure that the cells um, have broke, have expanded and broken down a little bit, which will then allow the fat to go into your potato around the edge and that will crispen up because of the caramelization that will happen. Thank you. So, so the science now, of how do you get your potatoes to be brown and crunchy on the, the uh, science happens it's uh, it's a magic ingredient that happens within your potatoes it's the Maillard browning and caramelization of the sugars so whilst you're boiling your potatoes you're releasing the starches um, on on there and uh, because of that, you've got your sugars in the cells coming up to the surface as well. So once you're putting them into the oven, the oven, which is very hot, um, initially you should have it around 200 to 220, um, and you'll put your potatoes in there, and that will form a crust around your potato. Don't leave them in at that temperature. You do need to reduce the temperature because otherwise you will burn your potatoes. And um, if they're too cold, if your oven's not warm enough, then you won't get that crisp that will happen around the outside on there. Um, and then that comes out to your potato and uh, part of your favorite part of your meal. So Merry Christmas to everybody and I hope you enjoy your roast potatoes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Vanessa. You. So we're on to our third course, the pudding, the Christmas pudding. And um, I think it's really interesting to think all of these bits that we've talked about so far. And whenever we're buying food, we need to think about making sure that we keep it safe. We need to think about how we're going to store it. And it's one of the big things at this time of year. You want to get the shopping in, you want to prepare, but also you need to make sure that by the time you come to eat it, it's going to be safe and it's not going to make you sick. So if we're going to the supermarket and we buy our prawns or we buy our frozen turkey, we bring them home and we put them in the same place. So we're going to put our prawns in the fridge carefully and keep them at that good temperature at four degrees. Our turkey, we desperately try and find space and squeeze it into our freezer and probably have nothing else in there with a good sized turkey. We think a little bit about use by dates and best before dates. And by doing that, we're making sure that, well, as far as we can, that our food is going to be safe to eat. But what's really interesting when we think about Christmas puddings is that actually some of the best Christmas puddings are ones that are made up to a year in advance. So you may have heard of this about making the pudding the year before and keeping it for a whole 12 months before we have it for our final Christmas dinner. And that's really strange. When we think about most foods, keeping something for a year isn't something we'd consider doing, maybe in the freezer. But even then, sometimes food in the freezer for a year can't, might not taste so good when we finally get it out to eat it. So we need to try and work out why it is that the Christmas pudding is able to stay sitting in a cupboard normally for all of that length of time. And why when we take it out on Christmas morning or sometimes even Christmas Eve to start cooking it, it isn't mouldy. And why we don't wake up on Boxing Day feeling sick and throwing up all over um, everyone else who's there and, and celebrating with us on Christmas Day. So what we need to do first is think a little bit about why it is that sometimes food can make us sick or in fact why the food isn't very nice to be able to eat. And almost always that's because of microorganisms that are growing in the food. So I'd like to introduce you to some of those microorganisms that we may find in our foods. Now almost always the ones that make food taste bad or make us sick are in two huge groups of organisms. The first known as the bacteria and the second known as the fungi. And I've just picked a few examples here to show you how some of these particular microorganisms can have an impact on the food that we like to eat. So the first one I've picked is an organism known as Micrococcus luteus. And actually this is an organism that grows on our skin. It's perfectly normal and natural, and it likes growing on our skin because it likes to eat fat. 
and our skin is covered in thin layers of oil and that's what helps our skin stay healthy. But if those organisms end up on our food, then they'll do the same thing. They'll start to break down the fats in the food. And what we can end up then with is a really particular taste and it's known as rancidity. It's when the oil has gone off. And it doesn't make us ill. I suppose it may not, may not make us feel very nice because it doesn't taste good, but it won't make us sick. It'll just be not very pleasant. And there's lots of other organisms like that as well, because microorganisms need food just like we do. So some microorganisms might start breaking down the proteins and we end up with food that's going rotten or putrefying. So these are things we don't want. They're not very nice. We want to make sure that our food tastes good when we actually get to eat it. Now, one of the other groups of organisms that we see quite a lot is furry fungus. And I've picked the example here of Penicillium chrysogenum. And Penicillia are the organisms that we often see growing on breads and make those furry funguses, furry moulds that we see growing on the surface of slightly old bread. Now, again, doesn't necessarily make us ill, but certainly not something we'd want to eat under normal circumstances. But some of you might really enjoy your blue cheeses. And actually, it's the same organism often that grows in blue cheese as we see growing on our bread. Now, I said it doesn't normally make us sick, but sometimes actually that can do if you've got somebody who's allergic to antibiotics, because it tends to be these furry funguses that produce antibiotics, which is incredibly useful for us in terms of treating infections. But for some people, it can make them really ill from an allergic reaction. And then we have a final group of organisms, and these are the ones that are really dangerous. And the example I've picked here is an organism known as Bacillus cereus. And this one grows on cereals, most commonly on rice. And you can see a picture again of it in here. And what makes that particularly dangerous are those big white blobs inside the cells. And they're known as spores. And spores are really, really resistant. So we can cook them, we can boil them, we can fry them, and those spores won't get damaged. So it's not until that organism is then left in a fairly nice environment, those spores will then germinate a little bit like seeds. Those organisms can start to grow and then they produce toxins. And it's those toxins that can make us really sick and give us vomiting and diarrhea. So we've got to make sure we don't have those in our foods. But it is keeping it safe, but it's also making it taste nice as well. Or when we come to eat the food, that it still tastes good. But microorganisms, just like us, as I said, they need food to grow. They need a lot of the same things that we do. So they need to have some water. They need to have access to water to be able to make cells. They need to try and avoid lots of salt and sugar. So if you've ever had lots and lots of sweets or salty crisps, you'll know sometimes you can feel a bit funny after that. It makes us a bit uncomfortable. And that's because we've got a high, what's known as osmotic potential there. And our cells end up losing water because we've got high concentration of salts and sugars. Other things we need to do, we need to try and keep warm, which I don't know how you're doing at the moment, but I'm struggling a little bit. I've got my nice warm duvet jacket on and actually wearing gloves as well at the moment. So microorganisms need to be warm as well, but they also need to avoid being too hot. And for some of us this summer as well, that was a real challenge. So we like that middling temperature. So all of the things that we're thinking about here, we need to think about stuff that we like, stuff that we don't like, and microorganisms are very similar and avoiding some of those nasty com compounds that will make us sick too. So we use all of that, all of those ideas as a way of creating safe food. And the process we do is what's known as hurdle technology. And it's exactly what it sounds like. So here we have our organism at the very end, just about to start its race. And it wants to get to the finish line because at the finish line, it can grow in a really comfortable environment, multiply up. And of course, that's all microorganisms want to do. They want to grow just and, and find themselves a nice environment to be. But when we think about food manufacture, if we can put hurdles in the way, we can stop those microorganisms getting to the finish line if we make those hurdles tall enough. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the hurdle technology that we put in place to make our Christmas pudding. So when we start to make it, the common ingredients we start with are flour, 
quite often. We put breadcrumbs in there and lots of spices as well. And all of those are pretty low in water. So we reduce the water content of the products that we're making. And because bacteria and viruses and fungi, or sorry, bacteria and fungi need water just as we do to be able to grow, if we remove water, they'll really struggle to multiply. Now, interestingly, with spices, actually some of them do a really good job of killing microorganisms as well. Um, cinnamon, for example, is actually antimicrobial. So some of the spices that we use are really good at stopping the growth. The next big ingredient for Christmas pudding is dried fruit. And dried fruit lasts really when, well in our cupboard for a long time. And that's because the water has been reduced. It's been dried out, but also it's got a lot of sugar in there. And we also add sugar to our Christmas pudding. So we're making it a very sweet environment. And as I mentioned, that can be quite uncomfortable for organisms to grow as well. Now, the next stage on our list is alcohol. And while some of us may enjoy some alcohol, actually, overall, it's not very good for us. Our body finds it quite difficult to look after. So we have a liver to help us eliminate alcohol toxins from our body. But microorganisms don't have that. So by using alcohol ingredients, we're actually making it a toxic environment for the organisms. And in fact, in the microbiology lab, we use alcohol, maybe not posh brandy, but we use alcohol on the surfaces to clean down the laboratory and make it safe for us to work. Now, a couple of the other common ingredients we have are butter and eggs. And these ones normally we do keep in the fridge. But butter is actually a really cleverly designed ingredient deliberately made to try and reduce the ability for bacteria to grow. And that's because some of the water has been taken out and often we add salt as well. So although we do keep it in the fridge, actually butter lasts really, really well on the side as long as it's not too hot. And then in terms of eggs, actually, most of the time, eggs on the inside are completely sterile. The surface may not be, but if you think about it, an egg is designed to be an environment where it's where the baby chicks grow. And of course, baby chicks, as they're developing, need to be able to say stay, stay safe. So actually, eggs are a really safe and protected environment. And it's not very often that eggs have got any kind of microorganisms in there. But even if there are microorganisms on any of these things, once we've mixed our pudding together, maybe put our silver sixpence in, we then end up cooking it normally for quite a long time and at high temperatures. So any microorganisms that may have got into our mixture will actually be killed off in that cooking process. So it's really hard for our microorganisms to jump over all of these hurdles to get to the finish line in order to be able to grow and thrive in our Christmas pudding. So that's what we do at the start, but what do we do to keep it for 12 months? And we have several stages that we think about for this. The first one is we wrap it up really safe. And normally once we've made our pudding, we don't actually transfer it or touch it too much. We take it out of the hot pot where we've been steaming it, wrap it up in cling film or baking parchment and leave it, don't touch it. Because by then we've created quite a sterile environment inside that pudding bowl. And by covering it up, we're trying to avoid any other microorganisms coming in. The next stage then is to put it somewhere cool and dry. And that normally doesn't mean in the fridge. We like to keep it a little bit at room temperature because actually that helps our Christmas pudding to mature. It lets some chemical reactions happen that creates really interesting flavours that makes our Christmas pudding even tastier. But we don't often keep them in the kitchen. Maybe we put it in a larder or in the cupboard under the stairs, or maybe in a spare bedroom that the, the heating hasn't been switched on. So we keep it cooler and we also keep it dry because that way any moisture in the environment doesn't get into our pudding and it keeps that Christmas pudding without the water that stops them. It's the hurdle technology carrying on that our microorganisms can't grow. Sometimes we actually end up feeding our Christmas pudding as well. So over the course of those 12 months of storage, we add extra alcohol. And again, as you can imagine, that means that we're stopping those organisms from growing, but still keeping our pudding nice and moist for when we want to eat it. And then finally, at the end, we steam it again, sometimes for up to eight hours. So Christmas Eve comes around, we unwrap our pudding we put it into the steamer and we get it going. And at that point, we are adding lots of water back in, but because we're going to eat it straight away, it's a safe thing to be able to do. 
And I think that's probably one of the most useful things to know. So once you cooked your Christmas pudding and you've steamed it for all that time, it's really important then that it goes in the fridge and we don't just leave it on the side because it's got all that water put back in. We need to make sure that the microorganisms can't grow. So it's then safe in the fridge and to be eaten up as quickly as possible. And then, of course, was one last step, because if we haven't used enough alcohol at all the other stages through the process, one of the things we like to do at the very end is to set fire. But I can promise you that's got nothing to do with keeping it microbiologically safe. That's absolutely for the fun of having a flaming Christmas pudding on your table on Christmas Day. Happy Christmas.